God the Village Green Preservation Society. God save the little duck, born of the land variety. We are the Desperate Dan Appreciation Society. God save strawberry jam and all the different varieties. Serving the old ways from being abused. Protecting the new ways for me and for you. Yes, now, so the Magnificent Ambersons opens on a very nostalgic note, looking at small-town life at the uh, start of the 20th century. Uh, we follow uh, Eugene Morgan, played by Joseph Cotton, who is courting Isabel Amberson, daughter of the town's wealthiest family. But she goes on to marry her other suitor, Wilbur Minifer, and has a son named George, who might charitably be categorized as spoiled. Mm, Eugene, yep. meanwhile, has become one of the uh, early developers of the automobile. And his fortunes, as well as that of the Ambersons, are explored in the context of the changing times of the society itself. This is a great sophomore attempt, I think, by Wells. While Wells' first film is about the scope of a single person's life over a great distance, over his entire life, here he's expanding it to a whole family. Each of the family members have different motivations mm -hmm. and different attitudes towards their place in society and the magnificence that they feel should be their position, especially so in Georgie's case. Right, right. Yeah, he is played as an adult by uh, Tim Holt, and he he's quite the character. He is kind of a little bit like Charles Foster Kane without the charm or the talent. He basically <laughs> believes that as the uh, child of wealth, everything should be handed to him and all should go his way and pretty much throws temper tantrums when not. So when he begins to court the Joseph Cotton character's daughter, who was raised in an entirely different set of values, it really sets up a fascinating dynamic of this old style view of wealth as something that's entitling and meaningful in and of itself to the idea of creating something innovative, in this case, the automobile, which is meant to represent everything modern, everything that's going to change the times that were looked back on so fondly. And so... It's, it's this wonderful culture clash as depicted in relationships between characters. And while Cain is a look at this level of regret and searching back and longing, perhaps, for the lost moments of a single person's life, however self-involved that might be, Amberson's expands that scope to have the idea of a lost society, a lost culture, a whole lost era of a whole where a whole group of people or a community or the world would exist. It it has that same sense of loss and poignancy that, like I think uh, Renoir did in his magnificent war film, uh, Grand Illusion. Good connection, and it, it, it's being done visually here as well, because we open with this montage of the way things used to be it's got the wistfulness of a kink song in its sense of nostalgia and then it's also physically embodied in the amberson house itself which the camera lovingly explores in its shadows and its detail and you know you have the old old man major amberson patriarch of the family and then you have agnes moorhead playing uh, aunt fanny who is kind of the uh, old maid sister who can't quite get it together but again all these all these interesting characters are portrayed in in the context of this uh, physical environment very much so. This uses like the 
house in that the Ambersons reside in almost has that same TARDIS level scope of showing a society in transition as the recent Darren Aronofsky film Mother hmm. does and uses it to vaster creative effect. You have betrayals, you have unusual alliances, you have great family gatherings and moments of intense loneliness, even a pointed moment by a boiler, actually. <laughs> and they're all done through all these different angles of sometimes showing the house in, cla in a claustrophobic way, sometimes showing it as like this vast expanse. And in fact, there's like several great sequences where uh, members of the family are arguing with each other and their stature and their position in the argument are represented as they walk up this vast circular stairwell. Mm -hmm. There's a, just a particularly just astounding moment where Georgie is in a moment where he has this holier than thou attitude where he's framed perfectly behind a stained glass window and he's and it's held there. <laughs> To show his sense of his own, you know, icon iconography, <laughs> right <laughs> in the in the realm of the Ambersons' lore, you know. And I am so so happy that you brought up the Kinks because <laughs> I was really thinking about that when looking at this movie, especially in the context of Kane, because. The Kinks are a band who, while they've had great songs, do not have that level of a cultural adoration that their compatriots, the Beatles, have. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Well, part of it is that the Kinks had different level of concern for, um, for the subjects of the music that they made. And part of that is a concern for the past and how that reckons with people living today. Kane is the Beatles. Amberson is the Kinks. Fascinating. I, I like that a lot. And, and for those of you who uh, might only know the Kinks uh, from a few of their hits, check out the album The Village Green Preservation Society and listen to the lyrics and see if there aren't some Wellsian moments there. Right. I mean, yeah. and look at like, and maybe that's part of the reason that Amberson's just is not held in such gigantic regard because it is doing, the, in a societal level, in a family level, its creativity is almost on par with the things that Kane is doing. But what Kane does is it has the shockingness mm -hmm. of newness, of audacity, maybe a near punk rock level of saying sense that there's no boundaries, you know? I You can get the feeling of like perhaps when the Beatles showed up on the Ed Sullivan show and the shock of it, I think it's kind of can be similar. But by mere virtue of trying to do a more nuanced story and a story that's diffused across all these different eras, it just doesn't have the jolt, the sustained jolt that Kane is able to preserve right. throughout the years. And it's based on a book as opposed to being an original screenplay. And of, of course, the elephant in the room when it comes to Ambersons is that it is not the movie that Orson Welles intended it to be. As we brought up uh, near the end of Kane, he had lost Final Cut at this point. So after the completion of filming, RKO stepped in and cut out a good hour of footage. Because it was that, originally going to be nearly over two and a half hours. Exactly. Correct? It was. It, yeah, there was so much more that was supposed to be in there. An hour of content was cut out, and the ending was reshot completely. Actually, by the uh, editor, Robert Wise, who would end up becoming a wonderful director in his own right, but here was utilized by the studio while uh, Orson Welles was doing other things that we'll discuss later, shot a studio-approved ending that Welles was adamantly against, and the original footage was destroyed. 
So one of the, it's one of the great uh, missing links of cinema is the original ending of The Magnificent Amberson. So we'll, uh, we should probably compare what we have and what we could have had. Yes, that, that's right. And it's cool, I think, to look at like the, just the different senses of places, about how Wells looks at places. Xanadu almost becomes a malevolent character mm -hmm. by the end of Citizen Kane. But the house that the Ambersons live is a character in its own right, but it's a lot more robust. There's a lot more things going on. There's a lot more crevices and, and um, nooks and turns in the story of the house mm -hmm. and the people that are in it than is in Xanadu, which is just an exercise in increasing isolation amidst the rubble of what you try to create in your life. Right. You know? And before we get to the, uh, that ending, there is a, a great moment where Georgie is praying because he is at his, like, last realm of financial resources and he's over in the bed where his mother has passed away at least it looks that way wells as the narrator the unseen narrator he does an expansion on the ideas that were done in kubrick's barry linden the sentiment in linden is that good or bad rich or poor they're all equal now <laughs> lost in the past but in that moment in Amberson's, throughout the course of the movie, the Georgie character has just been this just obnoxiously entitled brat, and everyone in town is focused on one particular aspect of that family. They may like or dislike other members, but they want Georgie to have his comeuppance. They want him's comeuppance. And the narrator says at that moment... That he has had his comeuppance, but everyone who had wanted it was either gone or they'd even forgotten. Which is kind of, isn't that the ultimate mm -hmm. kind of re a weird sort of revenge in a way, right? And then it fades out. And that's the last moment in that house. So I guess it's the last moment of the Ambersons' magnificence. Uh, of, and of Wells' film. Because right. the moment, what will proceed will be something that is not Wells. Right. Now, George has been on record as being very much opposed to the automobile. And in what brings a little irony to the table, George gets into a car accident. We are then brought into a uh, very anonymous-looking hallway in which Joseph Cotton and uh, Agnes Moorhead have been visiting uh, George in the hospital, who is uh, recovering. And uh, they basically, with dialogue, provide us a happy ending where George is going to be great. He's going to marry Joseph Cotton's daughter, and everyone is going to live happily ever after. And that's, that's the movie we have. The movie we could have had ended quite differently. It did have the accident, but the focus is that is shifted to uh, Agnes Moorhead's aunt Fanny, who uh, suffers a nervous breakdown, and there's a very uh, dark scene. This is all stuff that has been described, none of which uh, still exists, but we see her in a rocking chair, basically in an almost catatonic state as, as a comedy record of the time plays. Then we have a series of long tracking shots of George uh, wandering in the old Amberson household, which is now shown as decrepit and falling apart and a, uh, an empty shell of what it once was. You know, we can only imagine what these scenes will look like, but considering how amazing so much of this film is, it's a question out there is how much better could the film have been if it had been allowed to end with Wells' vision? See, the ending doesn't really bother me that much because while I can't say that Robert Wise quote-unquote screwed up, his filmmaking is so incognizant to what Wells has done 
up to the up to this point in the movie that it becomes kind of dismissible in my head mm -hmm. and all the great qualities of the film up to that point um, override the idea that oh at the ending is something you know it it comes across to me like almost it's could have been a big black scene missing title card mm -hmm. and <laughs> and so I'm not it doesn't di diminish or ruin the film to me in in my feelings about it however when I think of like all the expanded scope and the extended ambition that you was implied in the beginning of Amberson's what I really regret is that hour or hour plus of footage that was cut. I just think about like how Wells expanding his palette, but at a same level of creativity and inspiration that did Kane, but with an increased perspective, my God, what could that have been like if he had an extra hour and an extra level of control? to work with yeah what, what we have is very special but you know what could we have had and uh, that brings up the question is where was wells through all this when uh when his uh, movie was taken away from him yeah short answer is he was fired by rko long answer is he was fired in the context of making yet another film that he was basically assigned to after Amberson's shooting was completed, but before the editing was completed. And that is the now mostly lost film, a documentary called It's All True, which was uh, supposed to come out in 1942. There is currently a very good documentary about the making of this film of the same title that was released in 1993. Basically, just after Kane, Wells was appointed to become a goodwill ambassador to Latin America and was asked to go down to Brazil and make kind of an innocent travelogue film to uh, help with the war effort and strengthen the bonds between the U.S. and, and Brazil and, and Latin America. And as is Wells' way, he took this assignment and took it to an entirely uh, new level. Ultimately, when I look at the Amberson situation, mm -hmm. I cannot help but blame Wells a bit. Obviously, like he didn't, it was not his choice to get the movie yanked away from him, but you still haven't finished your other movie. Right. Okay. <laughs> Brazil will still be there. <laughs> Go and film your Samba movie after you make sure that the film is, is cut, it's in the can, and you are there in person. But the fact that you thought that you were going to be able to go long distance and, ed and edit the movie from another um, side of the equator is just such a real lapse of judgment, I think, for Wells. I mean, you should have either not taken the gig or if you couldn't, get the gig done mm -hmm. and then get right back to go and make sure that your film, which is which had a more ambitious scope and knowing the kind of dire danger that your previous film had been involved in, you should have like been more careful. Right, and RKO had it out for Wells. So with Wells out of the country and the Citizen Kane experience already putting him in disfavor with the studio, they took this opportunity to ensure that the art film that Wells wanted Ambersons to be would become the more commercial property through the removal of Wells. Yeah, I'm, uh, but, I mean, this is something that Wells was totally aware of, right? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it there, was there, There's no a... good decision-making on anyone's part here. Yeah. <laughs> Especially yeah. in retrospect, and I know it was a power play, but they destroyed the footage. So many lost films have, have been found and restored. Uh, we're still finding uh, bits of Metropolis to this day. Yeah. But unless there's a real surprise in store for us, um, this footage is gone. 
as is most of it's all true. So we, we don't really even have that in any kind of complete <laughs> format. So it was absolutely a situation now uh, where how is Wells going to operate in the context of Hollywood? And he did decide he wanted to with his next film. Yeah, the next film is an interesting example of Orson Welles trying to behave, a film called The Stranger from 1946. 